Welcome to CE Conversations, a clinical podcast presented by Creative Educational Concepts designed to improve clinician performance and optimize patient outcomes. This session entitled IV Iron Expert Exchange, Data-Driven Debates on the Revolutionary Role of IV Iron in Heart Failure. This activity is accredited for 1.5 hours of ACCME, ANCC, and ACPE credit and supported through an independent educational grant from American Region. To earn CE credit and complete the evaluation for this activity, please visit the link in our show notes at the conclusion of the podcast. And with that, we'll turn it over to our expert faculty. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. It's good to see you all. Thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Rob Mentz. I'm a heart failure cardiologist at Duke. Uh, we are so glad you're here. I have uh, Dr. Beacon Boskert with us, and Dr. Um, Muthu Vadaganathan is going to be joining us in a little while. Of course, we have to do a little bit of um, musical chairs here because we have our Hartford Steering Committee, so I'm going to have to jump a little bit early. Um, but we are, are so eager to have this discussion with you all tonight. It's such an exciting time, even over the course of today, as we see the evolution of IV iron data to offer this therapy for our patients. And this is just going to be a really invigorating session tonight as we talk through this data-driven debate, the revolutionary role of IV iron in heart failure. Thank you to CEC healthcare education for their support of this. This was supported through an independent educational grant from American Regents, so thank you for their support. We hope that you get a lot out of this. There's going to be important insights related to incorporating assessment of iron deficiency into your practice, when to think about IV iron, and how do you successfully use this. We'll go through guideline updates, data, and this is just really going to be an interesting discussion. So, so buckle your seatbelts. It's going to be a really nice evening. Again, Again, thank, thank you to CEC, CEC. and as I, I noted, noted, this was supported through an independent educational grant from American Region. Thank you for your support. I'll, I'll share this disclaimer. I won't read it in detail, detail but I'll summarize. summarize. So this slide deck has both original and um, unaltered format. format. It's, it's for educational purposes. purposes. So the current, um, it's current as of today, and we just updated with the uh, Ironman results that some of you may have seen just earlier this afternoon. Importantly, participants have implied responsibility to use this information to enhance patient outcomes in their own professional development. As noted, any procedures, medications, or other diagnoses or treatments discussed really need to be put in the context of clinician care, thinking about guidelines, the review of manufactured product, and comparisons with different recommendations from uh, relevant health authorities. And we have additional usage rights here as well that this slide deck is for educational purposes. Uh, it may be used for personal and non-commercial presentations. A couple of other opening items that I think will really set us up nicely for the evening together. So the e-syllabus, there's an electronic version of the handout and program resources available for download here. You can use the QR code. Uh, and I'll also remind you that we'll be using the QR code in the center of the table for some of the upcoming polling uh, as well. If you do have a question, there's going to be plenty of time for discussion uh, and good dialogue this evening. So if there's forms on the center. Please go ahead and write questions down as they arise, and we'll try to make sure we address all of those. In addition, we have a number of individuals joining virtually by Zoom. So welcome to that entire group. And if they have questions, we'll use the chat box, and then we'll bring those up to the group. So thank you for joining virtually as well. As noted, there are opportunities to respond by the browser through poll everywhere. So if, if you're new to this, um, you can see here, you can open your browser and navigate to this pollev.com slash CEC294. So sorry to get you mid-bite as you're having your dinner here, uh, but please open this up. This will help us as we go through some of the polling with the test questions so we can do the pre-test and the post-test. And again, it's just pollev.com slash CEC294. And then you can enter the responses as noted here. If you don't mind, go ahead and do that. Again, it's polev.com slash CEC294. In addition, there's responding by text message. So you can see you can text CEC294 to the phone number 22333. So you can also do your responses that way if that's easier. In terms of accreditation, you can receive up to 1.5 hours. As noted here, and the link can be found in your table, or for those on Zoom, it'll be in the chat box. Our disclosures are noted here related to research funding and honoraria, and appreciate our support from the peer reviewer, our PharmD expert. 
So over the next little bit, we're going to have a really good dialogue and discussion together, talking through these learning objectives. I'll hit these in, in really a high level detail, talking through the fundamental principles of iron metabolism and absorption, giving you some context that will hopefully add skills to your armamentarium as you think of the underlying mechanisms of iron deficiency, understanding how common this is, understanding differences between reduced and preserved ejection fraction as well as mildly reduced, recognizing the robust impact of comorbid iron deficiency. And this is going to be a complete frame shift. From our earliest days of medical training, we were often meant to think anemia, then iron deficiency. We've got to change that framework, thinking heart failure, iron deficiency. We'll be going through the utility of the iron indices and how to interpret that so that it's front of mind so that you can then teach others as well how to incorporate this into practice. We'll go through the recent ongoing and planned trials of IV iron, and we'll talk about guideline updates as well. We'll understand some of the innovative nanoparticle design of next generation IV products and talk through adverse event profiles, which are exceedingly low with these newer therapies. And then we'll talk through the, in a case-based format to analyze how the pro-inflammatory cytokines and the elevated hepcidin levels provide comparative utility of oral iron, but really that this needs to be IV iron. And we'll go through some of the earlier studies like Iron Out, which many of you are aware of that showed oral iron insufficient. It has to be IV to be effective. So uh, without further ado, we'll summarize some important points here around key discussion topics, scientific messages, and current clinical challenges. This slide, I think, summarizes some of the points that I hope you all will take home at the end of the day. The overwhelming prevalence of iron deficiency. If you don't realize how high the prevalence is, we're not looking enough. That needs to be the message. How do we achieve early and accurate recognition and diagnosis? And there's certainly huge regional variation in this. Some areas of the world are consistently checking iron indices every time these patients are coming into the hospital. When you see them in clinic, um, whereas many places, and I would argue in the U.S., uh, we're laggards here. We are not the early adopters, um, and now we're not even the middle adopters, given the strong evolution of data. We'll talk through diagnosis, treat to target, and rapid reassessment. We'll give the comparative analysis of the different FDA-approved products and talk through the guidelines, as I noted. Uh, heart fit is something that's been near and dear to my heart. We'll give some context around that, as well as the Ironman study that reported out earlier today, and I think sets heart fit up uh, for an even better position is hopefully the first positive uh, IV iron study as a large clinical outcomes program. And again, we'll have plenty of time for patient-centered questions, so go ahead and, and write those as they come up. All right, so now on to the pretest. Um, we'll go back here. I think it jumped ahead. All right, so again, reminding everyone you can use the QR code here. This will really help us frame the discussion and, and reorient, so I encourage you to please participate in this, get that QR code, it takes a second, or go to that website. But here is the first question. If you could go back, I think it just jumped ahead a, a little bit. It's coming, okay, perfect. All right, so managing iron deficiency or ID in heart failure centers on a treat to target and rapid reassessment cycle. Which laboratory indices are most important for guiding treatment, serum ferritin, TSAT or transferrin saturation, hemoglobin or A and B? I'll give you a minute here. Looks like we're settling in. Good. So, some different perspectives here about the utility of ferritin or TSAT in isolation, or as noted, the final one D, a combination of the two. Great. So, so hopefully, this will be something the group really settles on and, and learns as we discuss this evening. So, question number two. Which of the following statements best depicts the key distinction between absolute and functional iron deficiency? A, or only absolute iron deficiency has demonstrated an impact on clinical outcomes. Only absolute iron deficiency. B, functional iron deficiency results in reduced iron storage pools. Absolute iron deficiency does not. C, functional iron deficiency is characterized by normal or increased storage pool but diminished iron export and systemic utilization. Or D, absolute iron deficiency is commonly associated with hepcidin elevations, functional deficiency is not. Good, so some good opportunities there as we go through some of the keywords here around thinking about functional versus 
uh, absolute iron deficiency and talking through hepcidin levels. Next up, in a hyperinflammatory condition like heart failure, hepcidin levels are often elevated. How and why does hepcidin impact iron supplementation strategies? A, oral iron should be used preferentially and at a higher dose to overcome reduced intestinal absorption. B, hepcidin primarily affects iron deficiency with anemia and doesn't greatly impact iron supplementation for ID alone. C, intravenous iron should be, prefer should be used preferentially as it circumvents both reduced intestinal absorption and restricted ferroportin transport, or D, oral iron should be used preferentially because of the unique ability to overcome hepcidin block. Right, so, so some really important points around IV iron here in overcoming some of these challenges. Uh, next up, MT, this is a patient case. MT is a 67-year-old man with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and iron deficiency, a ferritin of 177 and a TSAT of 16. We had a recent hospitalization for acute decompensated heart failure. And per trial data, what clinical benefits does IV FCM or ferrocarboxymaltose offer to this patient? A, improved exercise capacity. B, enhanced health-related quality of life. C, reduced risk of heart failure hospitalizations. Or D, all of the above. All right, great. During your discussions with this patient, MT, about treatment options for iron deficiency in HEFREF, he asks what the guidelines suggest. You tell him that both ESC and ACC, AHA, HFSA have recently released updated statements, saying that in a much more patient-friendly manner, I'm sure. Which of the following are true? A, 20, um, the 2022 ACC, AHFSA, uh, AHA guidelines recommend IV iron to improve quality of life, but not functional status. B, 2021 ESC guidelines recommend specifically endorsing IV FCM in symptomatic HEFREF. C, iron studies are not yet considered part of the standard heart failure diagnostic. Or D, all heart failure patients receiving IV iron should receive a treat, a test dose to monitor for anaphylaxis. All right. So with that background, hopefully that helps anchor some of the discussions because each of these topics is now going to really come up in detail as we go through this together. So now to set the stage, a heart failure disease state overview and really going into the in-depth details around pathophysiology and real-world patient impact of concomitant iron deficiency. Again, I'm Rob. I'm a heart failure doc at, at Duke. I've now been there for a long time and I've converted Years ago to being a Duke basketball fan, if you despise Duke, I apologize, but this is going to be our year. <laughs> so this is a helpful framework, and we'll come back to this and go into deeper parts of each aspect of this. But I'll draw your attention to the middle of the screen around plasma iron and how that comes and how it's impacted in different organ systems. So you can see on the left, iron absorption coming in through the duodenum, plasma iron coming in that way. But now look at hepcidin just above that, that orange piece coming from the liver and how it blocks these different aspects. And we'll get into each aspect of this on an upcoming slide. And then as you look at toward the bottom of the screen, the role of the kidney, the bone marrow implications, EPO and RBC or red blood cell production, and this path on the right around the iron recycling that occurs and how this is all tightly regulated, but importantly can get dysfunctional in the setting of comorbidities specifically like heart failure in the setting of inflammation dysregulation and changes around hepcidin in plasma-bound iron. Now, looking at that first piece that was on that left side of the screen, talking about iron absorption, some of this we probably have not thought of since medical training, right? But this is helpful as we think of the utility of IV iron in contrast to oral iron. So ingested iron is F3+, plus, stomach acid converts it, and you can see that it's absorbed here in the proximal jejunum. Then look at the metabolism. It can be stored as ferritin. We, all, we recognize that routinely. Those stores can be replete, or it can be transported through the cell membrane. And in the next couple of slides, we'll talk about the cell membrane transfer, because that's really a critical piece to think about what is dysfunctional in heart failure and how we have to overcome it with IV iron. The exits to the bloodstream occur from these different sequestered stores through ferroportin. So that's going to be a key piece to remember. And you can see on the left side of the screen how hepcidin 
an inflammatory measure coming from the liver blocks that leads to intracellular changes there. So that's pulling then into the cell. So you have an ineffective transition out of the cell for your iron. So on the left of the screen here, now you can see iron out of the cell, the role of ferroportin in a macrophage, the sequestration involved in the inflammatory system. And again, looking at FPN or ferroportin on the left. And then on the right is the hepatocyte. Realizing the liver is a key source for iron storage in addition to other areas as we'll focus. And again, that role of ferroportin related to hepcidin dysregulation uh, that then leads to sequestration. And yes, you can have iron in the body, but it's in these storage chambers rather than effectively utilized. So my big area of interest has been comorbidities for many years, and you can see a list of them here, a number of both cardiovascular and non-cardiovascular comorbidities. I'm gonna emphasize in the middle of the screen, anemia and iron deficiency. And these, some of these terms, I think, have different understanding in different domains. And some don't routinely use this IDA language. So I think it's important to, to appreciate that because you will see that reference. But really this evening, our focus is gonna be on ID, iron deficiency, again, regardless of anemia status. And we'll give the data to support the rationale for that. This is one of the most helpful slides to show how common this is. So this looks by NYHA class with NYHA class getting more severe as you go toward the right of the screen. Then those top two portions are looking at iron deficiency combined with anemia in the blue, that darker blue, and then iron deficiency, no anemia. And what you see is, is symptom burden increases how common iron deficiency regardless of anemia status. So that's a really helpful framework that it's upwards of 50, 60% of our patients having this. And if we look at this another way, look at all of the different studies that have looked at patients with heart failure on the left, chronic, the outpatient setting, as you get toward the middle of the screen, some that included a com combination of chronic and acute, but then look at that right side, acute decompensated heart failure, my goodness, so many of your patients are gonna be iron deficient, uh, both in the hospital in that early discharge period. And over the next couple of slides, we'll talk through now absolute and functional iron deficiency. This is a really helpful framework and to think how this overlaps in these Venn diagrams with anemia as well. So on the left side of the screen, you can see anemia, where very commonly we use sex specific um, different cut points as well, and iron deficiency, even without anemia, and then that portion in the middle, the IDA term. Absolute iron deficiency or the reduction in iron stores, as you noted during that polling question, the causes are related to blood loss, malnutrition, malabsorption, and we'll come to those a couple of times to help reinforce these in the setting of heart failure. The diagnosis, low serum ferritin. So that's what probably pops up. Like when I look at my medical record, it's only gonna show ferritin turning up red when it's less than 30. So that's when it's really getting um, this absolute iron deficiency in a TSAT less than 20. But importantly, recognizing the role of functional iron deficiency. And whether it's our trainees, our junior colleagues, uh, even mid and senior individuals, not fully recognizing the differences as we diagnose functional iron deficiency causes chronic inflammation, this elevation in hepcidin as we've reviewed. And the diagnosis here is that serum ferritin 100 to 299 and a TSAT less than 20. And this is like the mantra I talk about on rounds when we think about heart failure and we'll reinforce this. So ferritin less than 100 or 100 to 100 to 300 with a TSAT less than 20. You've got to be able to roll that off uh, your tongue to really implement this effectively for our patients. The next two slides will now characterize these a little bit to give you a visual as you're taking care of patients. So absolute iron deficiency, you can see on the left, this is um, coming through the duodenum. This is related to reduced intake, reduced absorption, leading to a storage pool with reduced iron in the liver and the uh, reticular endothelial cells. So that's what this absolute, the storage pool, then you can see on the bottom, the functional pool reduced iron in the non-erythroid as well as markedly reduced. So this is all related to the storage pool, but, but impacting the functional pool as well. But now look at how that differentiates from functional iron deficiency as we look related to cytokines, inflammation. There's certainly in a strong inflammatory hypothesis with heart failure leading to elevation in the liver generation of hepcidin impacting um, that the changes with ferroportin and then impacting the, you can see the storage pool is relatively normal or actually increased, but actually changing the functional pool. So this is that functional language with reduced iron in the erythroid cells. So hopefully that helps give you a visual now, as you think where the storage pool may actually be normal or increased. And that's where, how that 
uh, ferritin piece will play a role. As we were developing this, I actually hadn't seen this framework before, but I think that this is really useful to think through these different groups. And that bottom left, you can see as we look at the axes, we've got TSAT and then serum ferritin, that absolute iron deficiency. Then there's this, the yellow one is this classical iron deficiency anemia. But then there's these possible iron deficiency around there, this functional iron deficiency that really give a good sense of how we use these different laboratory measures to best diagnose and then ultimately be able to treat our patients. And now to get into some of the important underlying mechanisms, each box here characterizes something that our patients are complaining of at, at different times as they're struggling with their symptom burden from heart failure. The implications around exercise capacity, they say, doc, you know, I used to be able to walk to my mailbox. I can no longer do that. Um, or as they say, oh, I'm, I'm, my symptoms are okay. And you look to the spouse and they're shaking their head, right? So we've got to elicit these important symptoms that our patients are describing, thinking about both the functional and the absolute deficiency. Look at that top box on the right. Reduced iron intake, definitely true. Think of the cachexia, the changes in diet, the reduced iron absorption as we've gone through, blood loss. So many of these patients, concomitant atrial fibrillation, they're on aspirin, they're on um, blood thinners, they're, they're having blood loss from, from that context, medications that alter the absorption of iron. And then as you look toward these different mechanisms, and we'll get into some of the details upcoming around mitochondrial abnormalities, the cellular changes, impaired cellular energy, um, the impaired erythropoiesis. So how common is it to see heart failure combined with renal dysfunction, the EPO axis is off, then you've got some anemia from these other reasons, and you've got iron deficiency even independent of all this. So this is certainly a complicated picture, but impacting our patient's quality of life. Uh, and yes, we really use the foundational guideline-directed medical therapies to improve clinical outcomes, but what are the patients asking for? They want to feel better. They want to function better. And now we also have those important clinical outcome data that we'll show later. This gets us back to that early uh, knowledge around understanding what's going on in the mitochondria. You can see on the left, iron deficiency leading to reductions in hemoglobin. On the right are the aerobic enzymes, changes in oxygen utilization, tissue performance, and really things are not good for our patients. And it's, it's just amazing to think of the functional limitations that they experience related to iron deficiency. So some helpful perspectives here, now looking at patient reported outcomes. So this is looking at health-related quality of life with the Minnesota Living. And on the top of the screen, you can see when we look at iron deficiency, yes or no, with higher scores being worse with the Minnesota living. Uh, and you can see that the impact here of iron deficiency is, is you look at each of these groups, but then look at the bottom. Anemia, yes, we know that, that studies have demonstrated in some cases um, negative implications for quality of life, but really it's often the iron deficiency that's driving this. And think how often you're checking a CBC when they're describing being short of breath or functionally limited, but if you're not checking the iron indices, this is being missed. These were some important newer data that give some context about what the future may hold as well. Iron deficiency affecting exercise capacity. There have been a number of recent nice papers that came out around serum transferrin receptor that can be measure of iron deficiency, but it's not affected by inflammation. Higher levels correspond with lower exercise performance. And interestingly, probably a different relationship by different EF phenotypes. So you can see the relationship is less linear in patients with HEFPEF, um, but, but still correlated as, as of note. And this second to last bullet, fortunately, this is really not routinely available. It's not available at our institution, but TSAT has a strong correlation with bone marrow iron depletion. So this is the measure that we routinely use. These are important figures that are often shown that highlight that iron deficiency alone is associated with worse in heart failure prognosis. So that's on the left, you can see looking at survival. So this is worse survival in those with iron deficiency as compared to those without. And then on the right is what I would argue is probably one of the most important slides. The most important figures here is you look at the hazard that we look at all cause mortality. On the left, there's no iron deficiency, no anemia. Then we get anemia alone, actually not significantly increased. Iron deficiency, no anemia, that's really where you start to see it. And then on the far right is the two in concert. And I, unfortunately, we often really don't focus on it until it's that far right, but we need to move upstream and be thinking about even those non-anemic patients. Functional iron deficiencies we've talked through, 
poor heart failure prognosis. And this is that definition that, that we rattled off earlier, an important study in 2011 of nearly 5 million adults with heart failure in a Medicare database, 50% had anemia. That's a good measure to keep in mind. And then as you look in the middle screen, the prevalence of iron deficiency in heart failure, we've now showed a couple different formats here. So in patients without anemia, 43%, patients with anemia, 60%. My gosh, this is like two thirds of your patients um, are iron deficiency, iron deficient. You can see on the right, the cumulative survival by the iron deficiency status. So we've talked a good bit now through inflammation, the impacts on hepcidin and liver, and we'll give some good context around some visuals that will help put this in place. So we've touched on a little bit of these, but I think the multifactorial etiologies are important to keep in mind. You can see causes on the left, reduced iron intake, low protein diets, anorexia. And it can get especially tricky in our patients that are obese, but are actually relatively undernourished uh, in dietary changes there. There's often the fluid levels as well in heart failure that can impact this. So you can um, misunderstand actually where they are in terms of their nutritional status as weight changes over time. Low protein diet may be recommended by some, especially in the setting of renal dysfunction. So now it's this perfect storm of, my goodness, we're struggling with the, the heart, the kidneys, and dietary changes. The impaired intestinal absorption we've talked through, medication changes is noted that can contribute to blood loss, and then chronic inflammation. So this box and this portion in the bottom right is a critical message here that these inflammatory cytokines stimulate hepcidin production and release. So that's coming from the liver. So that's blocking intestinal absorption and then inhibits the transport. So you're getting less into the system and what you get into the system, not able to mobilize effectively. So really a, a challenging situation for our patients. This is an interesting uh, framework that I think gives some context and I'll draw your attention to the right of the screen. As we look at those different measures, ferritin, TSET, in hemoglobin, look at that absolute iron deficiency. So you have that visual around the impact on hemoglobin and where ferritin sits, that tank, the ferritin empty. But then look toward the right. That's that inflammatory heart failure, functional iron deficiency. that's unfortunately really commonly missed just because TSAT is not appropriately evaluated. Uh, so thinking, making sure we have a comprehensive assessment. And I'll be brutally honest, like when I put iron indices in our order system, it doesn't give me TSAT. So think, what labs are you easily able to order? Are you getting the full picture? Are you missing details in your comprehensive assessment? So we've talked about this in a couple different ways, but I'll emphasize here the fulcrum role of hepcidin and thinking about um, as it impacts each of these systems. So it's coming into the tank and then also mobilization. Inflammation increasing hepcidin, leading to functional iron deficiency, and impaired oral iron, especially in this era where we talk about polypharmacy and I'm looking through the medication list with my patients and I'm trying to think, well, what can I stop? Oral iron. It's making them constipated. It's not absorbed. Let's get them off that and talk through IV iron as we'll show those data. These data are also helpful. You can see it shows the hepcidin response to oral iron dosing. Hepcidin levels on the left, and you can see um, the, the change is there, but then on the right, the iron bioavailability, not bioavailable. So oral iron, really not effective. It doesn't overcome the challenges, the changes that happen with hepcidin in the setting of inflammation. IV iron is the answer here. The IV iron mechanism, unique utility in overcome the functional IV iron, the, the functional iron block. So these, both of these bullet points are really foundational to keep in mind. IV iron quickly saturates serum transferrin and loads the macrophages, upregulates some of the uh, different proteins and subsequent ferroportin expression. That's probably new language. Not many people recognize that the changes around for ferroportin. So it's actually gonna effectively put this into your system. And the found fundamental mechanism, that is the basis for IV iron much greater than oral iron is now supported by all of our clinical trial data. So diagnosing and treating iron deficiency heart failure, a glimpse into this evolving paradigm. So particularly challenging to recognize these in heart failure because of this overlap with other clinical heart failure, dyspnea, edema, impaired oxygen utilization, even before they may become iron deficient in some cases. We've emphasized the key parameters. So many of you got this right from that first test question, serum ferritin, and TSET. You've got to check both of those. 
Serum ferritin strongly correlates with chronic iron stores. Roughly one micrograms per liter serum ferritin corresponds to 10 milligrams of tissue iron. And the thresholds for abnormal values need to be adjusted. I'm going to say that again. That's really critical. The thresholds have to be adjusted. And in patients with heart failure, as we've had this mantra, ferritin less than 100 or 100 to 300, TSAD less than 20. And it's it's got to be front of mind to help our patients. So here's that framework for those that prefer the visual diagnostic algorithm. Chronic heart failure, you check those iron indices. We've gone through less than 100, you're already sold. Uh, or 100 to 300, then you'd look at that TSAT. Check the anemia levels. You got to make sure you're not missing something else here. Uh, and, and all of the studies that have looked at this have said, when that ferritin is really low, you got to make sure you're not missing GI bleeding as well. Uh, but then importantly, so many of these patients, even with very severe iron deficiency, it's not always related to blood loss, right? We can't be thinking that, oh, just put that, put that aside, you're on blood thinners. Now, this is iron deficiency due to their heart failure and functional uh, iron deficiency. And then you can see the iron deficiency treatment algorithms noted there on the bottom. As we look through the guidelines, and we'll give more details around this as we move forward, the guideline recommendations, the most recent ACC, AHA, HFSA guidelines use that same language for diagnosis consistent across these guidelines, the target population, HEFREF with iron deficiency, again, really focusing on with or without anemia. And I used to like complain and when you would look at the older guidelines because it had under an anemia heading in the US guidelines that had talking about iron deficiency, thankfully all corrected now. Uh, so really emphasizing this comorbidity of iron deficiency. Uh, you can see the class recommendation was elevated to A, level of evidence B, and then the 2021 um, and the ESC, you can see they also pull in that recent heart failure hospitalization based on the firm AHF data and specifically call out IV FCM. And this is where I think that, aside from the trial that was presented today in an open label fashion, the data in heart failure is Beacon will nicely go through, it's all FCM. Uh, so that's where the, the evidence base lies for our patients. So a 2A in Europe as well. So the main event expert exchange here. So discussing a new era in, in heart failure management, the emergence of IV iron. This is what's been really exciting as we think, yes, we have SGLT2 and RNA additional oral therapies, but to be able to say, I'm not going to give you another pill. We're going to do IV iron in the clinic. You're going to feel better reductions in heart failure hospitalization. And I'm actually going to stop that oral iron that you've been taking as well. So this is really a standard pillar of care based on the data. So patient case, hopefully this helps bring it home to think of the patients you're taking care of. Patient AB is a 72-year-old woman, HEFREF, hypertension, diabetes, been hospitalized three times for acute heart failure within the last six months. Current medications, RNA 4951, so the middle dose there, uh, metoprolol succinate on the target dose, the high dose, spironolactone, good dose, DAPA, uh, furosemide, you can see the diabetes medication as well, aspirin of note. So Pretty good foundational four. Maybe there's some room to go up on RNA. We can get on the, the max dose there. Um, but then where do we go from here? So let's look at her exam. Blood pressure 108 over 68, heart rate 64. So maybe you ask some questions to try to tease out. Is there space? Can we go up on her RNA? Go to, one, to the 97, 103 twice a day. But importantly, you've thought about iron deficiency. We look at the labs. Creatinine and potassium are good. Hemoglobin looks good. Perfect example. This is so common in practice. You see that ferritin 172. You remember to check the TSAT. It's less than 20. So 100 to 300 with a TSAT less than 20. That's iron deficiency. So that's a really important piece. So we'll talk through maybe a little bit here and get, and get some perspectives. Is AB a candidate for oral iron supplementation? What should we be doing here, Beacom? What do you think? So she does have iron deficiency. And the TSAT, as well as the ferritin levels, are exactly in that category that Rob has been mentioning. The interesting thing over there is, if you go back slide, hemoglobin is 15. That is the upper threshold, usually, that was used up to which you would do the IV iron therapy. So in this individual, though, before we decide, well, hemoglobin is above the limit by which we would give the IV iron, think of whether this is a reflection of hemoconcentration, either due to overdiuresis and or, now comes the important concept, SGLT2 inhibition is also associated with hemoconcentration. So these may 
change, I would probably um, either look at the former hemoglobin levels and make sure she's not 17 at baseline. Um, and that this is maybe uh, needing to be attested to, making sure that she's not dry and hemoconcentrated. And look at that hemoglobin ceiling. Because if my ceiling is above 15, at that point, I will not be doing the IV iron therapy. But if her hemoglobin comes back as 14.7 or, or lower, we will be doing the IV iron therapy. What do you think? So really good point. I think as our use of SGLT2 inhibitors changes, and it's not just the hemoconcentration. Actually, there's increased EPA levels EPA related to changes in the kidney. So I think pulling in the hemoglobin piece, understanding background therapy is really important. But I think pulling out the message in this patient, I'd really be thinking about this functional iron deficiency and oral iron is going to be insufficient. We know oral iron is not going to work for this patient. All right. So with that, uh, thank you for your attention. Hopefully now you're all the experts on the underlying pathophys, thinking through hepcidin, ferroportin, the implications, how do we diagnose, and now it'll be really nice to go through all these data. Thank you, Beacom. Thank you. So th thanks to Dr. Menz, who set the stage really well. And uh, we're now going to be looking at the clinical trials. The first concept is the oral iron. So we do have a, a clinical trial with oral iron. And this was a study that was conducted in heart failure with reduced EF patients um, and looking at six minute walk distance. And the inclusion criteria went with the usual standard categorization for iron deficiency, either ferritin less than 300 or um, if it is uh, with a TSAT of less than 20%, or ferritin less than 100. So either of those categories were the indication. And looking at the six minute walk distance and the quality of life measures at 16 weeks. As you can see, there was no change in the outcomes, either in the peak VO2 um, early on or later on with oral iron. The important thing to recognize from, from the oral iron study, iron out study is, how much oral iron do you think the patients have received? Throughout the study, the average oral iron that one individual, a patient received was 33 grams. So that is an incredible amount of oral iron that unfortunately did not result in any changes. Now, if you could focus on the left panel, looking at the iron supplementation, which is the first two diamond brackets, as well as the placebo, which is the square brackets, as you can see, there's not much of a difference in the ferritin or TSAT levels with almost 33 grams of iron throughout the whole study. And if we were to compare this with the fair HF, which was an IV iron with ferric carboxymaltose in heart failure with reduced EF patients, we're gonna talk about that in a minute, you can see by 24 weeks, the ferritin level, as you can see in the diamond shape, is significantly higher with the IV iron, as well as the TSAT level. So the efficacy by which to correct the, uh, the iron deficiency is significantly higher with the IV iron. How much iron did the fair HF patients receive? Two grams. So the two grams does this much of a change, whereas the 33, 33 grams of oral iron did not make of a change in the ferritin or TSAT levels. And the other interesting um, findings from this study were the hepcidin levels were associated with the delta changes over TSAT, meaning the higher the, the hepcidin levels were, the lower the delta changes of TSAT. And this soluble transferrin receptor, which is a reflection of the intracellular iron, also were uh, um, higher in the high hepcidin, meaning the receptors were being expressed because the intracellular iron levels were low. If we were to look at the oral versus IV, yes, the oral iron is rather inexpensive but does create through oxidative stress a lot of 
gastrointestinal adverse events, the constipation, the nausea, the burning sensation, and has a lot of drug, drug, and drug food interactions. And the utility in heart failure, unfortunately, has been demonstrated to be ineffective. And we have just seen the results from the Iron Out study, which showed no improvement in exercise capacity and no change in replacing the iron stores. IV iron, on the other hand, though higher drug costs is associated with reduced healthcare expenditures, has been shown to be an effective high value treatment strategy. And the hypersensitivity reactions are exceedingly rare with these new agents. We're gonna talk about this in a, a little bit more detail. And utility in heart failure by numerous randomized clinic trials demonstrate improvement in quality of life, NYHA class, exercise capacity, reduction hospitalizations, and cardiac performance. So let's look at the evidence. The first study examining the role of IV iron was FAIR HF trial, recruiting patients with heart failure with reduced EF with iron deficiency defined very similar to what we have been quoting before, either ferritin less than 100 or ferritin um, less than 300 with a TSAT less than 20%. And they treated up to a hemoglobin of 16 or ferritin of 800. And this was a very important study as the early, um, the first study looking at efficacy. And they actually treated um, this up to 26 weeks for safety and the 24 weeks for efficacy. And if we look at the results, the self-reported patient global assessment, the NYHA class, six minute walk distance, the quality of life measured by the KCCQ overall score, and the visual analog scores, scores were significantly better in the IV iron treatment group compared to the placebo. And the effects or the benefits were seen as early as four weeks, looking at the separation of the curves in the lower panels and sustained throughout the study through 24 weeks. And if we examine those individuals who had anemia with low hemoglobin, or no anemia with high hemoglobin, the benefit was consistent regardless of hemoglobin levels or regardless of anemia. And overall, there were significant improvements in TSAT levels, ferritin levels in those individuals treated with IV iron. And I had mentioned that when I was presenting the iron out study, demonstrating how effective IV iron was in repleting the iron deficiency. There was also a very interesting finding. The effect of IV iron on kidney function as, a, as expressed as a change in EGFR seen on the slide. As can be seen, the ferric car carboxy maltose was associated with a better EGFR profile than placebo. The FAIR HF was subsequently followed by a longer study that confirmed the results of the FAIR HF. And the name of this trial was CONFIRM HF trial. Similarly, recruited patients with heart failure with reduced EF, again, with ferritin either less than 100 or 100 to 300 with TSAT less than 20%, examining exercise capacity with a change in six minute walk distance from baseline to 24 weeks with a continuation of the study up to a year for safety endpoints. Ferric carboxymaltose resulted in a significant improvement in six minute walk distance at week 24. And if you look at the sustainment of these beneficial results, you can see that these are sustained all the way up to a year, both in the six minute walk distance, as well as the symptoms that were measured according to the fatigue score. And in the aftermath of the FAIR HF and CONFIRM HF, there were several meta-analyses, which we will uh, touch on in a minute, 
But overall, both studies demonstrated improvement in exercise performance, quality of life, and overall patient status measured as global assessment scale and six minute walk distance with IV ferric carboxymaltose in patients with heart failure with reduced EF. There was a very interesting signal in Confirm HF. A secondary endpoint examined heart failure events, specifically heart failure hospitalizations. And as can be seen, IV ferric carboxymaltose was associated with a significant reduction in hospitalization rates. And this raised the question of whether there are disease modifying effects that results in morbidity difference with IV iron. Resulting in meta-analyses, as you can see, there are different permutations. If one were to look at heart failure hospitalizations alone, which is the third row from the bottom, you can see that in the meta-analyses reaches significance for reduction in heart failure hospitalizations. Combined endpoints such as cardiovascular uh, hospitalization and cardiovascular mortality, heart failure hospitalization, cardiovascular mortality, cardiovascular hospitalizations and even all-cause mortality, heart failure hospitalizations and all-cause mortality all achieve significance in meta-analyses. Meta-analyses on individual patient level data with ferric carboxymaltose also demonstrate the signal for benefit regardless of hemoglobin levels. So a patient does not need to have low hemoglobin levels for treatment with IV iron. And regardless of ferritin levels and with evidence of benefit in individuals with TSAT levels less than 20, but not over 20. And the pooled analysis in terms of quality of life measures consistently demonstrate improvement with ferric carboxymaltose with what we consider to be significant when the KCCQ, KCCQ scores are improved by five points, we consider that a very meaningful difference. And more than 10 points is really significant and over 15 points is markedly significant. And as you can see, we do have a signal for marked improvement in quality of life with IV iron. I know Dr. Vadigunathan was going to present this. Um, we could either proceed and or take a brief short break and I can answer questions before his arrival. Um, and I think he may be coming as we speak. Here comes the famous Dr. Vadigunathan who just happens to walk in as we introduce his name. Perfect timing. Oh, thank you, Beacom. That was... Uh... Wonderful, and uh, thank you all for joining at this late hour. Um, it's uh, really an exciting time, I think, for heart failure in general, and I think many of you may have felt that buzz at this meeting already that heart failure has truly elevated uh, to another level, and more importantly and pertinent to this discussion, I think IV Iron has finally joined this conversation in a meaningful way, and um, and I can see many of the, uh, we have, please continue to provide questions. We'll continue to collect them uh, and we'll have a nice discussion in terms of uh, practical questions related to implementation. So I'm going to start uh, this section with a case. Uh, this is CD. Uh, she's a 68 year old woman. Uh, she has heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. She's admitted to the hospital with fatigue and dyspnea and exertion. Uh, she has non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, thought to be related to untreated hypertension for years, uh, she, but she adheres to a low-sodium diet, lifestyle management, uh, but she continues to feel exhausted, with, especially with exertion. You can see here she underwent uh, menopause at age 54, but she's had menorrhagia for months, and in fact, she's been taking iron sulfate uh, uh, tablets, uh, capsules since then. Here's her medical regimen at present. She's on sacuptral valsartan. This is the middle dose, 49.51 milligrams, twice daily carvedilol, spironolactone, uh, and empagal flows in 10 milligrams. Um, and notably, 
These are largely target doses of each of these therapies. She's on the iron, as mentioned, uh, oral. And then she's on torsemide, 20 milligrams, two to three days uh, weekly, depending on daily weight. So this is kind of a PRN therapy. Here's her physical exam. She's visibly pale and fatigued. Her blood pressure is 90 over 72, heart rate 70, sinus rhythm uh, and normal. And this is on a beta blocker. And uh, otherwise, her uh, exam reveals no edema or other evidence of congestion. Uh, her echocardiogram, uh, she has an LVF of 25%. Uh, you can see her serum potassium is five. Her hemoglobin is 10 and uh, her metacrit is 30%. Could see here her iron indices, ferritin is 12, and her TSAT is 16%. So this is, um, you know, I, I, you know, we can actually have a brief discussion here. This is actually unique. Uh, we wanted to kind of intentionally uh, put forth a, a bit of a unique scenario. This is a patient who, with established heart failure, now presenting with perhaps signs and symptoms of heart failure, but in fact is found to have absolute iron deficiency. She's in the inpatient setting. What is your management strategies? And perhaps I'll turn to Dr. Boskert in terms of her comments. So in this patient, we do have evidence of a low hemoglobin. And I think it was 10, if I remember correctly, and history of menorrhagia. And despite the oral iron now demonstrating still evidence of significant iron deficiency anemia. I would definitely do a workup for blood loss. And because she's high risk, she's had uh, former bleeding and she may even have malignancy and or other etiologies of blood loss. And one needs to definitely rule that out and determine the causes of potential um, iron depletion or iron loss or lack of production. And in this individual, I think the iron loss is a very high likely concept. And of course, how to treat the deficiency in this case can be with IV iron, which can help both the absolute as well as the potential functional she may have due to the heart failure, but she has absolute iron deficiency. IV iron, though, in this setting would not be in the context of heart failure indication because she has absolute iron deficiency. So I would do a workup for blood loss and make sure that, that whatever that etiology is treated, the underlying etiology needs to be treated because that also a huge risk factor in the setting of heart failure. Mudu, what would you do? Oh, loud and clear, and I, I think that's exactly right. The parallel approach, I think we need to still think about the patient, put our laboratory parameters in context of the clinical um, clinical situation at hand, and I think that's exactly right. So always look out for signs and uh, signs of bleeding or evidence of bleeding uh, in, uh, in which there may be uh, occult other medical issues on, uh, happening. So all right, so let's review some of the data, and uh, this has been very exciting data and rapidly evolving, and we're at a very unique juncture in um, this journey in which uh, even important data were, were actually read out at this meeting. So a firm AHF was, the, uh, was a large-scale trial of acute heart failure. This was with the formulation ferric carboxymaltose. This was uh, in the management of patients who were hospitalized for acute heart failure um, and uh, with the initial IV, uh, uh, IV infusion administered prior to discharge. And the real question was in the decompensated patient that we frequently encounter in practice, who's found to be iron deficient, does IV iron uh, repletion, including at the time of hospitalization, prevent uh, and improve heart failure outcomes out to a year? And so this is not just talking about functional status and quality of life, but also other parameters of health status like heart failure hospitalizations. And so the trial uh, design and just a brief look here, I'll, um, I'll uh, bring your eyes here that this was a uh, really a blinded trial that was uh, executed with high quality. And importantly, patients were followed up over time. And if they continued to be uh, iron deficient, post-discharge, then further iron repletion was offered. And so 
Here are the key inclusion criteria of the individuals, uh, over a thousand individuals who are enrolled, hospitalized for heart failure with either mildly reduced or frankly reduced ejection fraction, and then iron deficiency, as we've heard, is as defined here, uh, with particular note of a TSAT less than 20%. So here were the primary outcomes. This was a total heart failure hospitalization. So this is not just the first event, but also if a person was readmitted multiple times, then all those events are considered. So really the total burden of heart failure over the course of the year, or if the patient died of a cardiovascular cause, could see there was about a 21% reduction with this IV iron strategy with ferric carboxymaltose, but the, uh, you could see the confidence limit just crosses one and the p-value is 0 0.059. Affirm HF was importantly one of the first trials that was impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, which made trial conduct as well as follow-up and uh, um, adherence to the protocol quite, quite challenging. And so if we, um, looked at a, the pre-specified COVID-19 sensitivity analysis. And you may think that, oh, what is a sensitivity analysis? This is actually something that was quite embraced by the US FDA and actually in fact encouraged during the design of these trials because we understood that clinical trials also, you know, these experiments can't be run perfectly during a pandemic. And so the FDA took the approach that well, if uh, uh, you can embed prior to unblinding of the trial, an analysis that's pre-specified that says that patients are censored at the time of a COVID-19 event. And in fact, if you do that, you could see there was still a similar magnitude of effects at 25% risk reduction. You, here you see that um, the p-value is significant at 0.024. So Affirm HF was important for a number of reasons, but the critical aspect is really reinstates this concept. The hospitalization is a key, uh, important opportunity for implementation of FCM, and also reinstates this notion of treat to target. I'll remind you that while we've had tremendous, tremendous advancements in heart failure care, I think we're at an important time point for uh, in uh, even across all of disciplines in terms of heart failure, all our therapies are take kind of this set it and forget it approach in, the, in which you start a therapy and you're intended to continue this therapy for the lifetime of the patient. And that may not be actually an acceptable strategy from a patient perspective. Patients often wonder, well, I feel better. Could I come off therapy? But of course, we, we reinstate that they should continue. IV iron takes a different approach, and that's a treat to target approach. It's a strategy approach in which you treat to repletion based on the laboratory parameters. And so that is actually much more acceptable for, and it's concordant with many other aspects of medicine that we practice, that we treat to a specific target that can be monitored uh, in follow-up. But it also re-emphasizes that the patient is not, you're not done with therapy at the time of hospitalization. This has to be a retest, retreat, and so really pathways of care in the post-discharge setting is really required. And of course, and we'll highlight this in just a second, this then moves the needle that IV iron is not just important about feeling better and functioning better, but in fact can move the needle in terms of hard clinical outcomes like hospitalization. So what do the guidelines say? And uh, we have a guideline co-chair here. And how will ongoing trials that are underway impact heart failure guideline-directed medical therapy? Um, so this is the 2021 ESC heart failure guidelines. We've been really fortunate in heart failure that just in the last year, um, we've seen two of the global guidelines being updated, uh, reflecting the latest evidence. So this is the 2021 ESC heart failure guidelines. Um, I will emphasize a few key points beyond treatment. Um, that are relevant to iron deficiency. Iron deficiency, first of all, is recognized as a comorbidity, and that might not seem like a major advance, but it is, in fact, that iron deficiency, independent of anemia, and on the same footing as diabetes, obstructive sleep apnea, obesity, is recognized in the treatment guidelines as a critical comorbidity that may drive outcomes in this patient population. The second is that monitoring and identification of these patients with iron deficiency is also strongly endorsed in that. So you could see this is the, uh, the kind of 
panel of, uh, of laboratory parameters includes the two critical components, serum ferritin and TSAT, both of which are needed to diagnose iron deficiency. And then the final aspect is around treatment, of course, and that IV iron supplementation and specifically calling out FCM because it had the bulk of evidence when this guideline came out that not only, uh, and it's indicated for two particular uh, areas here, both are 2A recommendations, so reasonably strong recommendations. The first is to improve uh, heart failure symptoms, improve exercise capacity and quality of life. And the second, importantly, is to, in an acute heart failure hospitalization, hospitalized patient, is to prevent heart failure hospitalization or reduce the risk of heart failure hospitalization. And you can see here, iron deficiency has now joined other important comorbidities in this parallel assessment of comorbidity management and pillar management. So we know the pillar approach for drugs. In parallel, we're assessing comorbidities. Of course, if a patient has heart failure with reduced EF, has important comorbidities that are unmanaged, we would do this in parallel. So these are parallel tracks that we take. The 2022 AHA, ACC, HFSA guidelines that were co-chaired by Dr. Uh, Boskert, again, re-emphasize these notions around screening, testing. And in addition, you can see this is the treatment pathway. And again, a 2A recommendation that IV iron is reasonable to improve functional status or quality of life. Um, and these are the, uh, the key kind of uh, comorbidity-based management, this parallel track. And again, very concordant that at the very top there, uh, iron deficiency is an important comorbidity and has a strong place in comorbidity management in these patients. So, uh, and then this is the screening and testing uh, uh, issues here. You could see a one uh, 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 class one recommendation for laboratory parameters uh, on initial diagnosis. So iron studies should be checked as an initial part and should be almost a reflex. And uh, in many healthcare systems, we've built this into our EHRs as, a, as kind of a panel on diagnosis for heart failure. Um, in which all these are checked to understand secondary causes of heart failure and assess for comorbidities. So this puts this side by side. I just want to put, uh, uh, show this, that two major global guidelines updated in the last year, highly concordant screening, testing, management, strong recommendations for IV iron. ESC guidelines specifically call out IV ferricarboxymaltose, and additionally, include the Affirm AHF data to reduce heart failure hospitalization in acute heart failure settings. So what's on the horizon and what recently reported um, since those guidelines? And uh, even though the guidelines just came out a couple of months, a few months ago, we yet have even newer data uh, to incorporate. So HeartFID is the largest randomized clinical trial assessing an IV iron formulation, and that is uh, currently underway and is due to report uh, very, very soon in the next year. Um, these are patients now in stable ambulatory care. Uh, and these are patients who have symptomatic heart failure despite background medical therapy. Uh, you can see here the standard iron deficiency definition that you've now seen a few times, either identifying absolute iron deficiency or functional iron deficiency. And then they are at risk for progression of disease. So they either have a recent heart failure event or they have elevated natriuretic peptide levels. The primary outcome is uh, a, a hierarchical one, death or total number of heart failure hospitalizations or a change in six minute walk test. Patients are randomized again uh, to placebo uh, or uh, FCM. And you could see a very large cohort being enrolled, 3000 patients. So we'll hopefully definitively um, uh, answer this question of whether IV FCM is an important adjunct to care um, and component of care in stable ambulatory patients with HEFRA. Um, HeartFID, again, uh, this is the uh, primary uh, outcomes we discussed. Uh, you can see here the secondary outcomes, um, you know, mortality and heart failure hospitalization are being assessed at a year horizon. Uh, six-minute walk are, is being assessed in the first six months. 
other components of those endpoints are also being assessed as secondary objectives. Uh, here is a second uh, randomized clinical trial, again with FCM also underway. Um, this is a trial of reduced ejection fraction, EF of less than 45%, uh, called FAIR HF2. Uh, so this is now the outcomes uh, uh, version of that trial. And again, high risk for progression with iron deficiency. Um, again, a clinical outcomes trial with um, total heart failure events or cardiovascular death. You've seen now this endpoint uh, a few times now, and uh, that will be the primary outcome. This is a 1,200 patient trial. FCM's given up to two grams, uh, two uh, doses of uh, two one gram in infusions. And then uh, treatment can, again, treat to target. Treatment can continue every four months um, if iron deficiency is not initially corrected. Okay, so to, uh, really today, just hours ago, we heard the results of the Ironman trial. Uh, Ironman um, was uh, another very unique trial. So this is for finally a different iron formulation. This is iron isomaltoside um, being studied in, again, patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction less than 45% with evidence of iron deficiency. Definition of iron deficiency is slightly different. Um, here we have uh, T set of 20, less than 20% irrespective of um, the ferritin levels and then ferritin less than 100. And uh, patients were randomized to um, uh, the IV iron or standard of care. So this was really an open label trial. Uh, hard clinical outcome, cardiovascular death or hospitalization for worsening heart failure. You could see the secondary outcomes there. And uh, this... Um, is just the juxtaposition of these two trials. Hartford, about three times the size of the um, of Ironman, um, and uh, is a blinded trial, um, whereas Ironman is an open label trial, um, and slightly different definitions of iron deficiency. Uh, but let's take a quick look at the Ironman data. These were published in. The Lancet earlier today, um, so these are hot off the press, at a median of 2.7 years, um, uh, fair, uh, so, so uh, the iron formulation demonstrated a, an improvement in the primary outcome. However, again, you see an 18%, so large uh, relative risk reduction, but you can see again, the p-value is just borderline 0.07. And again, COVID impacted this trial. We've seen many clinical trials recently um, that with the COVID-19 sensitivity analysis, it did again reach statistical significance. So very similar to the results of uh, a firm AHF. However, importantly, this is um, uh, a, a bit more of a pragmatic study. This was an open label trial. And so there was um, uh, some drop in of IV iron about 15 to 20%, even in the standard of care group, the usual care group. And so that may have also attenuated some of the potential benefits seen in this trial. So certainly, um, I think it was described, and I think appropriately so, and I'm curious to hear Dr. Boskert's take as a positive trial. Um, and I think it um, does uh, add to the totality of evidence. Um, uh, including a firm AHF. Um, Dr. Brosker, what are your thoughts on uh, Ironman? I think there's concordance of data um, through the whole spectrum of heart failure with reduced EF demonstrating a similar signal for benefit, um, especially that's attributable to hospitalizations. And the, the concept that we have seen in a firm is also repeated in Ironman, i.e., the COVID may have impact, impacted trial enrollment. And when a sensitivity analysis is done for the pre-COVID era, then the endpoints achieve statistical significance. And as you can see, it's in the order of about 24% risk reduction with a significant p-value. The confidence intervals come all the way to, yes. to one, but I do see these as um, a concordance of evidence and that there is evidence of disease modification with reduction in morbidity and hospitalizations. Wonderful. Okay, so um, IV iron has firmly joined uh, the arsenal of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. 
Um, I thought this was a, an illustrative picture that we have, of course, um, quadruple therapy, uh, four pillar therapy, um, but importantly now in parallel, both global guidelines recognize that comorbidities are critical to address alongside the four pillars in heart failure management. And IV iron is critically part of that, not only to improve functional status and quality of life, but likely to improve heart failure events. So now really we need to align this ecosystem, this implementation science framework in which we have the research that's been conducted now being evaluated by regulatory bodies and hopefully paid for by payers, but ultimately needs to reach patients. And, and that is will really require structures of care that are different than those currently available in, uh, in care, because this is a unique uh, mode of delivery. It's an IV therapy. This is a different treatment strategy. This is not start it and continue it for the remainder of someone's lifetime. This is treating a comorbidity that is trackable, monitorable. Um, and so this is going to require not only in, in the inpatient setting, but in the post-discharge and even in the stable ambulatory care setting, new structures of care. And I hope we'll discuss that in this last section here. So very quickly, um, what about HEF-PEF uh, and do the same uh, supplementation strategies apply at higher ejection fractions? So uh, this is a work in progress. There are trials underway, including FAIR, HEF-PEF. Just note here, this is a modest sized trial, 200 patients, but again, evaluating heart failure with an EF above 45%. Um, and uh, evidence of iron deficiency in the primary endpoint is six minute walk testing. So we'll learn more about HEFPEF. Of course, it is a um, uh, uh, principally important population to treat, but um, uh, it is uh, critical to understand. We do have some retrospective evidence from real world strategies that patients who have received IV iron uh, in clinical care um, have had, for instance, overall improvements in ejection fraction, improvements in NYHA classification. But again, this uh, will require prospective randomized testing to be affirmed. So uh, we'll again now turn to a case to help guide us in our clinical decision-making. HJ is a 71-year-old woman with heart failure, reduced ejection fraction, type 2 diabetes, chronic kidney disease, multiple hospitalizations for heart failure. Um, and here you could see Secubitril valsartan at 49.51 milligrams twice daily. Metoprolol succinate, 200 milligrams. Spironolactone, 25 milligrams. Torsemide, 20 milligrams. And uh, dapagliflozin, 10 milligrams. And metformin, 500 milligrams twice daily. Aspirin, 81. Could see her blood pressure, her heart rate there. Her weight is 62 kilograms. Her ferritin level is 184. And her TSAT is 18%. So we're going to talk about some of the practical steps. How do you select the actual therapy? What's the dose? How do you monitor the patient? How do we actually set up those implementation pathways in practice? And no better person than Dr. Bosco to take us through that. All right, let's talk about the how. How are we going to do this? So looking at the currently available IV iron products, I can make it simple by stating that the IV dextran, which created the fear against IV iron therapy, is not the agent that has been studied in heart failure trials. And keep in mind, yes, the IV iron treatment with iron dextran is the one that is associated with increased risk of anaphylaxis, not the other agents. So keep in mind, yes, there is a hypersensitivity black box warning for iron dextran. And the other agent that is not commonly used, uh, feroxy, uh, ferromoxitol, which also has a black box warning, has not been studied in heart failure. Neither of these agents were studied in heart failure. Sodium ferric gluconate is being studied in heart failure, is an ongoing, a relatively small scale trial. This slide summarizes the agents that have been studied in heart failure. Iron sucrose has been tested in 
small clinical trials with some um, endpoints that is suggesting benefit. But the largest scale clinical trials have been carried out with, as you have heard, ferricarboxymaltose. Until today, and you've heard about the results of the Ironman trial, the ferric derisomaltose um, is another um, agent that has now shown favorable, favorable, favorable um, endpoints, especially with the sensitivity analysis for the pre-COVID enrollment. So the, the ferric isomaltose maltoside or the derisomaltose agent now is added to the ferric carboxymaltose as potential agents with evidence of benefit in heart failure. But the largest scale of evidence with numerous clinical trials comes from the ferric carboxymaltose. And we now have ongoing definitive studies that will inform us about heart endpoints, cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalizations, as you have heard from the largest um, scale study, the heart FID trial that will be coming in early 2023. And if we examine the dose and the dose is changing, but now let's look at what the clinical trials have done. The maintenance dose that have been used in most of the ferric carboxymaltose studies were 500 milligram, as you can look at that bracket and the last row. The most recent studies, the confirm HF, effect HF has used a 500 milligrams every 12 weeks. That was the approach used in the trials. And the overall, the mean average dose is represented on the first row, about one and a half gram to two gram range is what has been used in the clinical trials for repletion. The mean dose of the ferric carboxymaltose administered in a firm acute heart failure trial was 1,352. This is a very interesting study. Remember, it's an intent to treat um, to repletion of the iron stores. The first dose was administered before discharge at index hospitalization, and the second dose was given at six weeks. And the maintenance was then at three months, then six months. So almost every three months. And the high dose ferric carboxymaltose is now approved in the United States as a maximum single dose of 1000 milligrams. The alternative approach is two infusions of 750 milligrams, seven days apart, one week apart to a maximum dose of 1500 milligrams per course. In Europe, maximum single dose is um, listed on the right side. And there is definitely a weight-based algorithm. Um, the 1,000 milligram maximum dose is only recommended in individuals that are with a weight exceeding that of 50 kilos. And or the 750 to be repeated in seven days is for those individuals with um, greater than 50 kilos. For those who are less than 50 kilos, weight-based um, dosing of 50 milligram per kilogram uh, in two doses separated by seven days is what is to be administered. As I mentioned, um, the, the maximum single dose of 1000 milligrams has been approved um, in April of um, last year. Um, the alternative is the 750 milligrams one week apart as two infusions. What about safety concerns? What has been implicated for the anaphylaxis is this carbohydrate complex that the iron is coated in. And in the setting of dextran, which is a very high molecular weight compound, it's thought to be having a cross-reactivity to bodies, autoantibodies to, to native polysaccharides. And dextran is the one with the largest molecular weight implicated in that anaphylaxis. The other carbohydrate shell products are listed on the right side and do not have that high anaphylaxis risk profile as dextran does. Their molecular weights are lower, their immunogenic profile is lesser. It's that coating that causes the reaction, not the iron itself. And the misconception that IV iron is unsafe and has created this hesitancy, especially in older individuals 
um, and especially um, in individuals who are high risk. But we need to recognize that our patients who definitely would benefit from iron replacement therapy should be treated in a timely manner. These older studies that were carried out with Dextran should not be used as an excuse not to treat the patients appropriately. If we look at the meta-analyses and looking at serious reactions that includes anaphylaxis is very low with ferric carboxymaltose. 0.1%. And actually, if we look at the anaphylaxis rates alone in the both fair HF and subsequent studies, that was zero. The anaphylactoid-like or serious reactions were the 0.1%. And the systematic review and meta-analysis of all randomized clinical trials, looking at all IV iron replacement, replacement therapies, demonstrate that we do not have a signal for increased anaphylaxis, especially with these new agents other than dextran. So keep in mind, any IV medication has a potential to cause high hypersensitivity reaction, but the reactions with the current IV um, uh, replacement therapy uh, drugs are very rare. And with the newer agents, these are becoming even rarer than before. So these gro gross misperceptions surrounding the management of minor reactions are being perceived as anaphylactic reactions. They are not. They're not even IgE mediated. And one needs to be careful not to call these as anaphylactic reactions. And I will now pass it over to Mutu, and I will need to depart for another meeting. He will be addressing the, the repeat questions and potential questions from the audience, and it was a pleasure to participate in this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bosker. A really uh, treat for all of us to hear from you um, uh, and your perspective. So really, we've heard um, many things here, but I, I want to kind of bring us to the forefront of practical aspects and take-home messages at the end of our time here. So our goal is really, of course, as a community to reduce the population burden of heart failure. And today, unfortunately, we have this large implementation chasm, and it's critical that structured pathways are enacted in practice to help close this chasm, inclusive of IV iron, and here are the key take-home elements. Specific iron indices are needed. That's ferritin, TSAT, in the diagnosis of iron deficiency. Oral iron formulations are unfortunately slow to replete, insufficient, and hindered due to systemic inflammation in the context of heart failure, namely elevated levels of hepcidin. And so de-implementation of iron, oral iron formulation should be uh, uh, in practice for mo most patients in heart failure. IV iron is clearly shown to improve functional status and quality of life. And now in two trials um, shows strong suggestion of benefit even on heart failure hospitalization. Ferrocarboxymaltose at the present time is the most studied formulation and is being studied in the largest randomized clinical trial of an IV iron formulation that's expected in the last year. And again, structured approaches to closing this quality improvement gap. Um, and so we are going to um, move towards the questions in our last remaining um, uh, aspects here. And um, just going to here. So um, we'll first quickly go through the post-test questions. Rem remember, this is via your uh, scanned uh, QR codes. Managing iron deficiency heart failure centers around a treat to target rapid cycle reassessment. Which laboratory indices are most important for guiding treatment? And I apologize, I might have clicked uh, through too quickly. Um, but really, it's centered around these two key parameters. Which of the following statements best depicts the distinction between absolute and functional iron deficiency? 
only absolute iron deficiency has demonstrable impacts on clinical outcomes. Functional iron deficiency results in reduced iron storage pools. Absolute deficiency does not. Functional is characterized by normal or increased pools, but diminished iron transport and system systemic utilization. And absolute iron deficiency uh, is common and associated with hepcidin elevations. Functional deficiency is not. This is these those complex charts and uh, biological mechanisms covered by Dr. Mentz. Again, that's correct by the overwhelming majority of you. And even with concomitant anemia, iron deficiency is prognostically meaningful. Um, iron deficiency in, an, uh, in heart failure is associated with which of the following clinical manifestations, poor quality of life, reduced functional uh, status or exercise capacity, worsening heart failure trajectory. This is morbidity, mortality, or all of the above. test takers. And in hyperinflammatory conditions like heart failure, hepcidin is often elevated. What does hepcidin do uh, in terms of our impact on iron supplementation strategies? Oral iron should be preferred. Hepcidin primarily affects iron deficiency with anemia and generally doesn't affect iron supplementation and iron deficiency alone. IV iron should be preferred or oral iron should be preferentially used because of its unique ability to overcome the hepcidin block. Excellent and good. Hopefully re-emphasize the critical aspects even in terms of the pathophysiology there. And MT is a 67-year-old man with HEFREF and iron deficiency in recent hospitalization for acute decompensated heart failure. What are the clinical benefits of IV iron um, with FCM, ferric carboxymaltose, uh, in this individual? So improves exercise capacity, quality of life, reduced risks of hospitalizations for heart failure or all the above. And that is correct. So during your discussions with MT about treatment options for ID and HEFREF, he asks about what the guidelines suggest. So what's uh, what did the guidelines show? The ACCHA guidelines recommend IV iron to improve quality of life, but not functional status. The ESC guidelines say specifically endorse IV FCM. Iron studies are not considered part of standard guidelines, uh, uh, diagnostic pathway, or all patients receiving IV iron should uh, should receive a test dose to monitor for anaphylaxis. All right, some wiggling here, but really uh, I think everyone's centering around that the ESC guidelines call out the, the weight of the evidence with FCM or ferric carboxymaltose. Um, and specifically call that up. Okay, so um, we are at time. Um, uh, however, I'm hoping that we can stay for just a few additional minutes. Um, uh, and if you do have another engagement to get to, please feel free to step away. Thank you for the robust number of questions. And if you have any live questions that you'd like to ask, there's a microphone being passed along. I'm gonna move through these fairly quickly and um, uh, give you my own personal takes on um, uh, on these elements. So the um, first question is, would you start IV iron in a patient with active infection? It's a great question. And in general, it's, it's clinical situations in which there's really severe infections, often bacteremia, in which we may not co-treat a patient with IV iron. But in general, for most hospitalized individuals um, with these non-severe infections, IV iron should can be safely administered. Um, other questions are related to um, what are the instances where we wouldn't necessarily treat with IV iron? And that's another great question. And I think, um, you know, the scenarios that I think we think about, so while um, iron levels and iron uh, may, may fluctuate, patients with a history of hemochromatosis or I, I, um, uh, kind of iron overload states 
Those are patients I, I probably wouldn't treat. Patients with true anaphylaxis that's documented with that IV iron formulation, I wouldn't treat again. Um, and again, it's uh, a laboratory-based assessment that we're working on. So that um, those are the patients. And um, if anyone else has any other particular clinical situations who um, they would or would not treat, uh, go ahead. Oh, hello, good evening, everyone. My name is Anton Morenko. I'm from Hackensack JCUMC. Uh, thank you for this excellent discussion today and giving some better insight on the benefits of IV iron in this uh, patient population. So the question I'd like to ask as a follow-up is, in regards to when you do check the ferritin levels and the TSAT levels, do you check that while they're admitted for acute decompensated heart failure or when they're euvolemic in the clinic? And if so, is there a difference between the two scenarios? Yes. Thank great, you. great, great question. Thank you so much. And you check it at the time of acute decompensated heart failure event. Um, and I think that this is a parameter that may fluctuate with the degree of uh, um, uh, uh, various scenarios like inflammation, bleeding, other aspects, but is an important that you can track something over time as well. And so irrespective of care setting, you should be able to check um, uh, these iron indices. Great question. Um, iron Man, what are the clinical implications of this trial? And um, you know, this is, uh, I think, an important trial because it adds to that totality of evidence. It's a second clinical outcomes trial, again, in a highly favorable direction. So I think supports the overall strategy that IV iron is important. Um, I, for one, am awaiting heart fit. I think it'll give us a definitive answer here. Um, if you note, it is about three times the size of either of those components uh, of those individual trials and will definitively give us a, um, a solid answer in terms of whether these drugs should be used primarily even for morbidity and mortality. Um, so where does oral iron ever figure into your treatment algorithm? You know, in practice, it is for most patients, oral iron is something that is like a vitamin that is um, often taken over the counter or maybe even um, uh, uh, added to a regimen, someone doesn't reassess it often in practice, and patients are on it for years and years and can often actually have adverse GI side effects, but they tolerate it because they think it's important to their care. I think with education, it's actually a really nice opportunity to de-implement care. So I, uh, because heart failure, uh, therapeutic regimens have grown, I often review their medical regimens, identify things that I feel safely that I can discontinue. And that often helps me negotiate introduction of additional medical therapies and uh, IV iron. So I don't see a clear role of oral iron. Uh, it does have slow repletion in some patients. And so when there is tremendous kind of access issues um, in terms of um, uh, treatment facilities with IV iron, um, oral iron can certainly be considered in the background. So how often do you recheck iron levels? You know, it, this is going to vary from uh, site to site and, and from practice. Generally, I think we can follow what the clinical trials have generally done, and that's checking it every three to six months, that time frame. And so uh, we want to allow some time for the repletion to actually affect uh, systemic levels, recheck and retreat. So that's the key pathway. Um, and uh, this... Um, uh, what is the most important barrier to implementation? I really do think that uh, the challenge is that this is a different approach to care, and this is not an oral therapy, and uh, we currently don't think about IV therapies. Um, we have seen some uptake in many systems, and uh, often IV iron is easy to implement in the hospital setting, and so we do sometimes, um, we've seen growing uptake in, in hospitalized patients. However, um, I think the largest barrier will be in ambulatory care, repurposing current facilities, for instance, IV infusion clinics for diuretics um, to be able to administer this um, or creating additional standardized pathways in which we can implement care. Um, and then this is a challenging question. Do I think that this is a class effect? And I, I uh, class effect of IV iron and ultimately, in heart failure, we have been burned by issues around class effects. And so, for instance, with the beta blockers, you'll note that the US guidelines recommend three specific beta blockers. 
um, and don't recommend other beta blockers like atenolol or metoprolol tartrate. And that's because either there's insufficient evidence or that some trials actually showed neutral effects. And so in a complex disease state like heart failure and with a therapeutic like I IV iron, which may have different um, biochemical properties, but also rate of repletion may be different and dosing may be different. I think we should stick to the clinical trial evidence. And um, I think that these two uh, iron formulations are what we have currently. And we'll see if HeartFID clearly positions FCM as a leading candidate. Um, I know I reviewed many of those uh, quickly, but I, um, uh, I will stay around for uh, a few minutes here. And do we have one question here? Okay. Hey, thank you. Um, you think you kind of touched on this a little on the different formulations, but what are your thoughts on like extrapolating it to things where if you don't have FCM on formulary, like using dextran or gluconate? Yeah, it's a good question. It's, it's often coming up in clinical practice because many of our institutions uh, um, are slow to adopt new formulations. Um, I think it's a call for local champions. We've dealt with this now in, um, in each domain of heart failure care. I'll give you the example of the SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, the two that were best studied in heart failure, dapagliflozin and empagliflozin, sometimes weren't available on inpatient formularies. And so we were using alternative uh, SGLT2 inhibitors, but that actually spurred local champions to then petition with their local formulators to be able to get therapies on. Um, and I think that's what we need to move towards. And um, in the meantime, I think that using alternative formulations is a reasonable approach. Um, but uh, ultimately, I think we should be uh, concordant with evidence-based care and, and petition for uh, the ones best studied in trials. All right. Thank you again. We really appreciate you joining, especially being captive and uh, so engaged with questions, both in person and online. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. Take care. Thank you for attending this edition of CE Conversations. We hope it has been impactful for your clinical practice and most importantly, for the patients you serve. Please proceed to the link in the show notes to complete the post-test and activity evaluation to claim your CE credit.